Well, hey there. This season at First Church, we are talking about hope, real hope. It's unfortunate that all over the world and even in our own community, there are people who respond to their lack of hope with violence and intolerance, while still others retreat into this self-imposed isolation that, well, honestly, it compromises their emotional, spiritual, and mental health. We all know it's easy to lose focus and forget that the greatest source of hope is believing that Jesus is raised from death to life. He's alive. So real quick, before we get into the message, I want to invite you, if, uh, if you'd like to further connect with us, further explore this topic that we're talking about, hope, then check out our website, firstchurchnp.com, or um, feel free to even reach out and shoot us a text at 308 730-4040. That's my number. 308-730-4040. Would love to connect with you. Thanks again for joining us. Here's this week's message. Enjoy. Uh, some of you were aware that I was not here last week, okay? The rest of you, shame on you, okay? You should have been here. I heard Micah had a great, great message last week. So, uh, but uh, I was at a conference, and um, it was a great conference, of course, and uh, it's very good. But uh, one of the guest speakers was Denzel Washington. Anybody know Denzel Washington? Okay, all right. Four of you do. That's good. So the rest of you, um, like he's an actor, okay, producer, director, all those kind of things. Also a man of very deep faith in Jesus Christ. So uh, he was set up to be a speaker, um, uh, and this happened about a week or so ago. Uh, But you know what happened like a day or two before? We had a little episode at the Oscars, okay? And uh, Denzel was there, of course, because he's one of the greats. And uh, he was uh, the first to go up on stage and to help kind of moderate what was going on there. Um, And if you don't remember, um, Will Smith um, slapped another person on stage. That doesn't go well anywhere, but it didn't go well there. And Denzel and I believe it was Chris Rock went up and uh, tried to bring some resolution. So the conference I was uh, at was um, sponsored by Bishop T.D. Jakes. Um, I like him a lot. I like his theology. And so uh, Bishop Jakes was interviewing Denzel. And um, it's interesting because Bishop Jakes' questions are like a full page long you know, and uh, multiple times uh, Denzel would say, could you repeat the question, please? And I thought, that is so cool. That is so cool. I've wanted to say that many times, but never have had the nerve, but he did it. The other thing I learned about Denzel is the man knows what he's about, who he is, and what he believes. And so his answers are very succinct, very short, and absolutely clear. So um, Bishop Jakes would be expecting, you know, a paragraph for an answer or something, and he'd get five words, you know, and that just went over and over again. Well, finally, Bishop Jakes could not stand himself, and he had to ask about what happened at the Oscars, expecting to get a little bit of juice out of that one, okay? And um, Denzel is a man of godly character, and so he said, Uh, I'm not going to share what was said uh, and what happened. Um, And, uh, but he did say, I I was, I I did go up on stage to try to help there. And uh, so Bishop Jakes asked Denzel, so what did you do when you got the two guys off stage? And um, he said, I prayed with them. Now, for how many of you, when you come into a situation where there's conflict, is your first response is to pray with the people? Not just for them quietly, but pray with them out loud. And then this was a remarkable thing. Bishop Jakes asked Denzel, why did you pray? And this is what Denzel said. It seemed like the right thing to do. Now, I want that to lodge in your heart or in your heart and in your head, and you think about that. Prayer seemed like the right thing to do. We are a church who believes in the power of prayer. I believe prayer is the right thing to do. 
but our world doesn't. And that's why that's such a fascinating and important comment from someone who has as great an influence as Denzel does. So I wanted to share that with you because I think there's hope out there in our world. There are people who are really sold out for Jesus, who really know what they believe and are willing to stand up for that in public, in situations where you'd never expect that. Oh, and you would also want to know that Denzel Washington prayed for me out loud, okay? Now, there were four or 5,000 other people there too, but he prayed for Doug, okay? And I will not forget that, uh, to have Denzel Washington pray for me. That's a remarkable thing, and it shows you so much about a person's heart and about their relationship with Jesus. So we're teaching your children and your grandchildren how to pray out loud. And if that's uncomfortable for you, all I've got to say is get over it now because it makes a difference. It makes a difference on a stage where the Oscars are going. It makes a difference on a stage at a conference where Bishop Jakes is leading leaders. All right. Um, I want to kind of make a comment. By the way, Alex, where did you go? There you go. Alex, you did a great job reading the Scripture, okay? Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, the boy reads with authority, okay? And I like that. I like that. So um, you'll notice something about the, the text. It's from 2 Corinthians. It's not from the Gospels, okay? You would expect, because this is the first day of Holy Week, this is Palm Sunday, that we would be reading from one of the Gospels today and that we would hear part of the story. It's called in the Bible, the triumphal entry of Jesus. It's about him riding the donkey, coming into the city of Jerusalem, and it kind of launches the whole week that ultimately ultimately leads in the execution of Jesus. That's the text you would expect. Palm branches waving and all of that, but you all have a, a kind of a strange pastor. So no, we're not going to read that story. I am going to reference it, but I think the passages from Corinthians really build on the story that we have, the account that we have in the Gospels. So here's where I want to begin. On that Sunday, they had no idea what was going on. Parents and grandparents were just as clueless as their children and their grandchildren. It's important to keep that in mind because sometimes we think that with age we gain spiritual wisdom, spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity and wisdom is not a function of age. It's a function of our heart and our mind paying attention to Jesus. The most spiritual people there that Sunday were just as ill-informed as those who were far from God. And the most successful were just as oblivious as those who had nothing to show in life. So with no idea with what was about to happen, they sang songs, they waved their palm branches, and they danced in the streets. For them, it was a party. For them, it was a carnival. For them... It was a parade. So as Jesus approached the city gates of Jerusalem, he was riding quietly on the back of a donkey. He made his way through a crowd of people who did not understand what he was doing. And here's why. Sometimes we are so convinced of what we believe that we're not open to the next movement of the Holy Spirit. The people believe that with Jesus, with his coming on that day, all oppression was finished, all suffering was over, and all tears would be wiped away. They believe that Jesus was bringing in the fullness of the kingdom of God that afternoon. And so that's why they were celebrating in the way they were, and that's why they missed part of what was going on on that day. Now, it's interesting that they believed the fullness of the kingdom of God was coming and that that would wipe away the tears and the loss and the suffering and the oppression of the world. But that's not a unique belief in the Scripture because several years later, the apostle John was living on the island of Patmos and he had a vision he had a vision, and God spoke to him, and Jesus spoke to him. 
And the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And in that vision, what John saw was what it's going to be like someday when the fullness of the kingdom of God comes. And it's remarkable how similar it is to what the people were expecting on that Sunday we call Palm Sunday. So I want to read from the book of Revelation. This is John's vision. And it's chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. And Jesus says, in the vision, Jesus says, the Lord God will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. Sounds very similar to what the people expected on that Palm Sunday. So as Jesus rides a donkey into the city, the people believed there'd be no more loss, no more tears, no more pain because Jesus was in their midst. And we teach this kind of belief system that if you give your whole heart and mind and soul to Jesus, you'll never again have a problem. You'll never again have anything that hurts. You'll never again shed a tear. It's going to be all joy, but you and I know that's not true. It's not true. But that's what the people were celebrating on that Palm Sunday. This idea that when Jesus is with us, when Jesus is in us, we won't have any more suffering or pain. But Jesus knew that before the kingdom of God comes in all of its fullness, there would be great suffering and even death for the Son of God. Jesus knew that before there could be victory and resurrection and the kingdom, that there would be pain and suffering and loss. What Jesus shows us in this week we call Holy Week is that there's kind of a rhythm to life. There's kind of a rhythm. Hundreds of years before that Sunday, King David captured the rhythm of our tears and our joy. I want to read it. It's Psalm 30, verse 5. And David, for David, this is a song, so imagine him singing this. Listen to the rhythm. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Weeping may come in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping may come in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Isn't it interesting that the resurrection happens in the morning? The promise is that joy will be restored. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter what your family's going through. Doesn't matter what your best friend is going through. Joy will be restored. Hope will be renewed and peace will be experienced. But before all the promises of the kingdom are fulfilled, there is often suffering. There may be dark seasons with no light. There may be tears flowing with no help. There may be restlessness with no promise of peace. But the good news is that joy comes in the morning. Think about Holy Week. Jesus agonizes in prayer in a garden on Thursday evening. He is whipped almost to death on Friday morning, and then he is executed by the Romans on Friday afternoon. Three days later, in the morning, following all that darkness, all that pain, off all that suffering, three days later, in the morning, there is the greatest joy the world has ever known as Jesus is raised from death to life. Suffering does not last forever. Suffering does not last forever. Your suffering, your best friend's suffering, your child's suffering, suffering does not last forever. On Sunday morning, the resurrection of Jesus proves that. Weeping may last in the night. But joy comes in the morning. The resurrection of Jesus is like the great reversal of human suffering. Think about that. That's what we hold on to as as Christ followers, is a resurrection of Jesus. And in that is the great reversal of human suffering. Rather than suffering crushing us, destroying us, or making us bitter, our suffering can bring us to a place of joy. It took the Apostle Paul a long time to figure that out. And so it may take us a while to figure this out 
as well. But when Paul figured it out, the truth set him free. He found a strength and a courage that he didn't know before that helped him to endure his own pain and suffering. So I want to turn to the text that Alex read for us, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 and 17. This is Paul's insight. This is his learning from the Holy Spirit. So he says, we do not lose heart. And I just want to stop there for a moment and make a comment. I bet that most of us here know a person who is losing heart, who just feel helpless. They feel hopeless. They don't know if they can try at it anymore. So we do not lose heart, Paul writes, even though our outer nature, our body, our physical body is wasting away, our inner nature, our soul is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Paul learned how our suffering can become an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to produce in us a Christ-like character, to produce in us a humble heart, to produce in us generous compassion. Later in the same letter, Paul speaks about how our faith in the Lord gives us strength during our suffering. It's 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, and Paul begins by quoting Jesus. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul offers a little commentary on that. He says, so I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. I want to just alert you to something. When you leave the walls of this church or any church, you're going to hear the exact opposite message. We're going to glory in strength. We're going to glory in success. We're going to glory in praise. But listen here, for whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Sometimes we try to deny our pain. We try to deny the abuse we've experienced. We try to deny our tears. Sometimes we do our best to ignore the pain in our family history or the suffering of our neighbor or the injustices in our world. And yet the Bible is clear that through our dependence upon Jesus, during our suffering, we become stronger and more courageous. Now, before Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem, He had something to say about the rhythm, the rhythm of suffering and strength, the rhythm of affliction and joy, the rhythm of pain and hope. So I want to read you, this is from Luke 6, verses 20 through 23, Jesus' understanding of this rhythm in life. He said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man, for surely your reward is great in heaven. Do you feel that rhythm? you feel that? The rhythm of suffering and then strength, the rhythm of despair and then faith, the rhythm of tears and then joy. That's what Jesus was all about on that first Palm Sunday. He was going to show them that before the joy, before the victory, before the resurrection, there is often some pain, there is often some suffering along the way, and we shouldn't try to ignore that or deny it. It was not all his fault. There was another person who made some bad choices too, but he was hesitant to put blame on anyone else. He acknowledged, he confessed, he admitted that he had made some very poor choices. Choices always have consequences. This is one of the hardest lessons to learn in life. Young children and teenagers struggle with this all the time, all the time, that every choice has a consequence. In fact, we struggle with it so much that some of us at age 60 are still trying to learn this lesson. All choices 
have consequences. And sometimes those consequences are a wonderful blessing and bring us great joy. Other times those consequences bring regret and guilt. His choices destroyed many of the good things around him. He was not sure that his boss would keep him on the job. He was not sure his children would still respect him. He was not sure that his marriage would survive. There were so many tears, so much sadness, and so much shame. The pain was almost unbearable. And then one night, after a very difficult and long day, a friend came to the house and prayed with him. The prayer did not immediately take away the pain and the suffering. It didn't immediately take away the regret and the shame that he was enduring. And that's something for us to remember. Sometimes prayer will be used by Jesus to instantaneously reconcile, restore, and heal. But sometimes it doesn't happen immediately. But the prayer did something important in his heart, his mind, and his soul. The prayer reminded him that there is the light of Jesus even in the midst of the darkest night. The prayer reminded him that there is hope that comes through faith in Jesus when the days seem like they can't get any worse. The prayer reminded him that there is joy on the other side of suffering. The prayer reminded him that even when he is weak, Jesus will make him strong. He began to understand what Paul learned long ago. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The Palm Parade reminds us there's a rhythm to our suffering and joy. There's a rhythm to our weakness and our strength. The truth is, I may be weak today. You may be weak today. Your best friend may be weak today. But Jesus is right now producing strength in us. And we know that is the case because Jesus not only suffered and died, but he was raised from death to life. And that's the victory. That's where our hope comes. That's where our joy comes. Let us pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you. As you rode the donkey through a crowd of people who really did not comprehend, did not understand, did not know what you were about and what you were doing on that day, as you rode the donkey through that crowd of people who had no idea what you would endure that week, you still came. And you did endure unbelievable suffering and pain. You shed tears. Your body was racked with pain. You felt forsaken and forgotten by your heavenly Father. But you knew that not only during this suffering would the Father give you strength and courage, but that on the other side of the suffering, there would be victory. There would be life. There would be deep, deep joy. So I pray for us today that we might not get so focused upon the hoopla of life, but instead become focused upon your amazing love for us. I pray especially today for those who are suffering. I pray for those who are disillusioned and defeated. I pray for those who are lost and longing. I pray for those who are helpless and hurting. I pray for those who know no peace and hold on to no promise. I pray for those who are sick in their body, for those who are sick in their mind, for those who are sick in their heart. 
And I pray that we might lean even more upon you, Jesus. And may your love and your mercy give us the strength and the courage we need to live through these rhythms of suffering and joy, of despair and hope. And I ask our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.